Hi everyone, welcome to the Tenderly Part 2 workshop event. Um, we have Nenad here giving us some more um, knowledge and more specifically about the code. Um, while he sets up and gets ready, why don't you box what you're building? Um, we'd love to see what you're all working on. Um, also, if I could please ask that you all put your um, microphones on mute, um, just so it's there's less distractions. And if possible, please could you put your cameras on because it's really nice chatting when we can see your faces. Um, that would be very much appreciated. Again, welcome to this workshop. I hope you get some good um, knowledge out of it. And if you have any questions, pop it in the chat box. Nenad would be happy to answer it in the end. Um, and yeah, I'll be posting some links there too. So keep your eyes on the chat box. I hope you enjoy and I'll hand over to Nenad. Oh, yeah. I no. thought I unmuted myself, but it turns out <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> So as I said, hi everybody, welcome to the second Tenderly workshop. Last time we attempted showing how Tenderly features work from the perspective of the dashboard. And uh, we went through some of the most important ones and uh, through a critical step of contract verification. And today we'll see what, what additional value can we have and what can we actually do uh, are in the area of monitoring smart contracts. Um, the goal for today would be to go through a multi-sig wallet smart contract, just briefly, uh, and then build uh, a monitoring uh, monitoring around it, so we could be aware when somebody uh, sends a transaction or executes a transaction, approves a transaction, uh, and on top of that, we'll build another layer, which is a serverless backend for that. Uh, this means that we'll write some JavaScript code and that JavaScript code will execute when somebody submits a new transaction, approves it, executes it, and so on. Uh, and that means we can react when something happens on chain. So when a smart contract is called, we can have our, our specific JavaScript code running in response to those events. Uh, so this is just a brief overview and we'll go through all of this in, in far more detail uh, in a moment. And uh, I'll continue, continue where I left off the last time. So just a brief overview of what we covered. Last time we covered uh, the smart contract registry should we call it, where you can add the smart contracts we're interested in. Uh, you can observe the transactions that uh, happen uh, on chain, uh, of course, involving those smart contracts you're interested in. And uh, we've seen the debugger. So the tool that allows you to inspect how transaction went, uh, the state changes, it incurred events that were emitted and so on. And then we took it further with simulation. So taking any simulation happening on chain and uh, any transaction happening on chain and simulating its execution, of course, while changing some of the parameters or changing the, um, the, the, the values of storage slots within the smart contracts. And uh, today we're going to deal, uh, today we're going to deal uh, with so we developed this. Today, we're dealing with alerts and Web3 actions. So if you think of it, the, these three, three things that we saw first, they allow you to actually observe what's happening. They allow you to dig in and dig deep to understand the behavior of your smart contracts, the interactions with other smart contracts, and how transactions play out. Um, so it's that they, it gives you that kind of understanding. And this part is more oriented in you being more passive, less inquisitive, but setting up ways uh, that say that setting up tools that allow you to be well, well alert when something that's interesting to you happens. And interesting to you, that may be uh, a particular address from a list of addresses called your smart contract or your smart contract received uh, value that's higher than some amount and so on, or your smart contract is being drained, which is something that you would also 
uh, want to be alert as it happens. Um, so this is what alerts are for, and we see them in action really soon. And the second thing is alerting is fine. You'll get an alert every single time calls your smart contract, but we can, we can be even more lazy. So being a lazy programmer, you're going to write some code that will respond to any event happening on chain. So you can actually automate uh, your processes. You can, uh, for example, pause a smart contract or uh, when somebody initiates a process, you encode it within the smart contract. You can react to it by collecting some data, uh, by sending messages with aggregated data that you collect to Slack, to Discord, to Telegram. Uh, you can even tweet about it. It's your code and you pretty much can do anything from it. So these are the two things that we're going to cover. This second part, as I said, puts you in a more passive position as things happen on chain. But of course, it requires you to write some code, set up some, some things so you can actually you know, reduce anxiety and, and relax a little bit in that regard. All right, so <clears throat> here I have Visual Studio Code, and uh, please let me know if if this is if the font is big enough. Uh, just go thumbs up if this is big enough, or you'd like me to, or thumbs down <laughs> if it needs to get bigger. Anybody? I'll keep it here. All right, so uh, today we'll just deal with a very rudimentary version of the multi-sig wallet. And multi-sig wallet is a thing that's happening. It's actually a thing you can use to submit transactions that are pending to be executed. And uh, they get executed when enough people, let's say, uh, approves the execution of the transaction. So your regular wallet, uh, you want to do something, you click a button or do something like that, or just use ethers and the transaction goes to the network. But if you're in an organization, one way uh, you can use to have agreement from the people within the organization is by using the same wallet. It's not the only way, but it is one of the, the ways good enough for the examples we're gonna do here. So the idea is that you submit the transaction to the multi-sig wallet, and this is what event TX submission stands for. And then people who are owners of the wallet, so it's people with special addresses that belong to the organization or form the organization, they can confirm that transaction because, uh, for example, executing it will yield uh, some results that you like, or you can skip confirming uh, if you think it's a bad idea. And when there's enough of confirmations, then you can execute the transaction. Where is transaction stored? Well, the whole transaction is actually stored within the, the wallet itself, uh, the multi-sig wallet. This is the transaction array. So the transaction thingy uh, that we see here, it's, um, yeah, this structure over here, and it just has the address of the recipient, the value it carries, the data it carries, so it can be used to invoke a second smart contract. Uh, and we're also keeping track whether or not it's executed and the number of confirmations it got from the owners of the multi-sig wallet. So just to recap, multi-sig wallet, it's got owners, people who somehow form the organization and whose opinion on transactions matter. Uh, we have an array of transactions, and the way you use the multi-sig wallet, you submit a transaction to the multi-sig wallet, and over the course of time, you have to ask people, hey, can you approve my transaction? Can you approve my, my transaction? So maybe two or three approve, and if you have enough approvals, then you can safely execute the transaction. So what we want to do here, we don't really need to go through the code because I think I explained the dynamics and the behavior of the, the, the wallet, but we have functions that are used to, well, uh, submit a transaction. And if we open it up, it just pushes it to the array and then it's the event, confirm transaction, 
So this one gets the transaction from the transactions uh, array in contract storage, increments the number of confirmations and emits the event that TX confirmation happened. And of course we have execute transaction. And here we can see that, okay, we're getting the transaction from the storage, we're fetching it, and we're checking whether or not it has the requirement that the number of confirmation it got is greater or equal to the number of required confirmation. So if, if it's five of you within your organization using the multisig, uh, you can configure it so two approvals are good enough, three approvals are good enough, or if you're really strict, four or even five approvals are good enough. So this is something configurable. And this is the contract we're going to, to work with. All right, so first let's set up an alert. And for alerts, I created this little um, Discord server that I use for, for these testing purposes. And here's a demo and code. So let me go back to Tenderly and go back to alerting. And I'm gonna create an alert for every single successful transaction that happens on a contract, multi-state contract. So I deployed this one previously. It's one of the contracts within the project. So I'll select that one and I'm gonna go next. And for destinations, uh, well, we do have alert Discord that I used and another Discord that I used. So let me try adding a new one over here. So this one will be ETH Safari and the Discord webhook, I'll copy it here, then on code integrations. And I do have a webhook that is already present here. Just copy the, the URL, come back to uh, the dashboard and paste it over here. And when I add the webhook, it's present. It just takes a moment to enable it. And if I save it, all right, we got it. Now, what we can do is we could either issue a transaction right now, or of course you're trying to figure out if this works without waiting for transactions to happen, you can test this alert. And in order to test it, you will need a reference to a transaction that already happened. So we need to have already a transaction and we need its hash. So we have to back off from the screen and I'm gonna go back to transactions. So here we can see a bunch of transactions involving this multi-sig wallet. So I'll just take this one, submit transaction, and I will copy the hash of that one. Okay, so far so good. Going back to alerts and entering the one that we just created. And let me take this cord and pull it, pull it back here. All right, so if I go trigger test alert, paste the address, and we know that it's Robson and trigger test, here we go, we got an alert. And you can see from here that it's not really rich because it says, hey, you got a new alert from your demo encode ETH Safari. This is the name of my project. And the alert says it's a it's a successful transaction in multi-sig. And this is the transaction that actually triggered this alert. So that's the transaction cache I actually pa uh, passed. So this gives us enough confidence that when a real transaction happens, you can actually, uh, you will actually get this sort of message. All right, now before we move along, uh, I think it's a good idea to see other alert types that we have in here. So you can really do a lot of stuff, successful and failed transactions. Okay, those are sort of expected. Uh, you can go function call, uh, function call alerts. So whenever a function in your contract gets called, and let's just see how this one looks. So you can pick an address. This is actually picking a contract, a network. So uh, uh, the ones from all the addresses happening on that network or alerts for every project, uh, uh, every address in the project that you're following and so on. I'll stick to, to this one and uh, I'll take this contract's address and you can pick here 
any of these functions that are present within the multisig. So you can go really, really, uh, you can set up of, uh, monitoring and improve your observability of the contracts using this. And I'll just go through the other ones. So events emitted. So this one happens whenever your contract actually emits an event. So here you get a list of all the events that are defined within the contracts, within the smart contract you just picked. So our multi-sig wallet, and then we have event parameter. So this one goes even crazier. You can set up an alert that goes off when a particular parameter of the event, uh, for example, is bigger than some value or less than some value. So you can use the data in the events to set up alerting around your smart contracts in that manner. The token transfer whitelisted uh, callers, so uh, addresses that are allowed to call the contract, that are not allowed to call the contract, ETH balance, trans uh, transaction value, uh, uh, of course, these refer to changing balance of the contract or the value that's been transferred. Uh, the state change, which allows you to observe when the state variable changes its value. Um, the next one is the view function, which alerts you whenever a view function changes value. So a view function in Solidity, it gives you, uh, it returns values that are calculated using the other fields, the other storage slot, slots within the contract. So it's a non-mutating function. But when some of those variables change, then the return of the view function might change. And this may be a good indicator to you, oh, something interesting happened. So you get a notification about it. And there's more coming soon. This will just give you <laughs> uh, some space to write some of your own ideas of what is useful for you uh, that you would like to monitor. So this is all about the alerts. And I will come back to, oops, we'll come back to this one. And when, when you look at this, um, hopefully you can see it well, um, we don't get too much information. We do get this link. And when I click the link, yeah, it's opening up the Tenderly dashboard. So you get to see that transaction as it executed. Let me just uh, expand this. So the thing that we saw the last time, it gives you the debugger and you can see the state changes and all that kind of stuff. All right, so can we do better? Uh, we can do better with Web3 Actions. And you can think of Web3 Actions like alerts with some code that can be run. So alerts just, uh, just send you messages with links, but Web3 Actions, they run some code for you. So there's a way to configure Tenderly with some code and um, specifying some conditions when you want your Web3 action run. And there's a way to do it using, um, using the UI. So when you click Add Action, again, you can pick several different uh, trigger types. So events happening on-chain or off-chain that will cause your code to run. Now we have a block trigger. So every time a block is mined, uh, your Web3 action code gets invoked. And uh, just like 20 minutes ago, we, we published a new post on the blog about uh, counting blocks until they merge. So if this sounds uh, fun, or if you're looking for some inspiration, check it out. Uh, there's the periodic, which executes well every five, 10 minutes, whatever. The webhook, trigger uh, that allows you to create an action that exposes a webhook you can use. And for example, you can use it uh, and make a curl request or uh, put it in an external system or CI, CD, something like that. So it allows you to use HTTP to invoke an action on Tenderly. Uh, and most commonly it's used for continuous integration. So uh, the um, continuous building of your project running tests and stuff like that. And another trigger type here is alert. So this helps you, but let's just see how it goes. We'll skip this one. So it's the code that we have to write. This is where we, where we go to smart. And 
the trigger well alert action trigger. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, the one that we've seen, uh, the one that we created should have appeared here. Um, not sure why not. I'm not going to go there today. But one thing that's disabled is transaction. So if you want to monitor the transactions that are happening, um, for example, just uh, monitor monitor every transaction that goes into your smart contract, or monitor events that were triggered that were emitted from your smart contract, then you can't really use the uh, dashboard, so the, the UI. And to do that, we have to go to code. So here I am in Visual Studio Code. And here, the, this is the multi-sig wallet. And this whole thing, let me just zoom out for a second. Uh, this whole thing is a hard hat project. So in the package JSON over here, you have uh, not this one, uh, and this one over here, you have all the hard hat dependencies and it's it's pretty much there. Um, so the, the question that comes up, okay, how do I do that from code? Well, there are a couple of things. The first one is that we have uh, Tenderly CLI that you can download uh, and install on your machine. So you can find it on GitHub. There's, um, there's an instruction manual here. And when you, when you install it, you have to log in in a way. So when you run Tenderly Who Am I, it should give you uh, your email and your user. Okay, fine, I'm logged in. So how do we get going with Web3 Actions? To get going, I'll just create a temp folder here. Um, yeah, and change to it so I don't make too much, uh, too much stuff over here. And we can go tenderly actions in it. When you do this, uh, you get to pick, um, you get to pick a project and uh, yeah, I'll go with this one I called blank. And then you get a prompt uh, asking about the folder you're adding your actions to and stuff like that. And it generates uh, a scaffolding. So you have a folder and if you look closely, it's an NPM repository. So this whole thing is, uh, contains the code of your Web3 action, the action function to be precise, to call it in proper terms. And if you go to example TS, you, you can see here that it's block hello world function. So it indicates that it's an action function. And to help with development, we also added these um, type script types within a tender reactions package. So yeah, this is something that comes fr from running the command tenderly in it. And here you can define anything you want. Uh, so uh, you can just log to console or you can install Axios and do HTTP requests to the outside, to the web two, or you could even, if you're brave enough, store your private key in tenderly secrets and do requests that go back to chain. So you can even trigger transactions that go back to chain in response to something happening on chain. Um, so this was the quick start with uh, the code, but there's one piece missing. How do we tell Tenderly that this should be invoked whenever a new block is mined? To do that, you can see that we have this Tenderly YAML over here. And this is actually the place where we have to be specific about it. We, we have this actions part, then this is my username, my project, a uh, couple of things that are pretty standard, runtime sources. Uh, about the sources, this value to the right, this is the name of the directory that holds your action functions code. Coming back to the directory structure, so here I am in temp, this is where tenderly YAML is, and this is the actions folder. So this actions folder, just next to the tenderly YAML, this is the place where we are searching for sources. And then we go with specifications of the actions. So this one we call the example, and you can add some description so you can tell it apart from the rest. The function, now this is, uh, this is a reference to the JavaScript function. 
it, it consists of two parts. The first part is the path to the file where your action is defined within this folder defined by sources. So this means that we should go actions, example.ts. So it's this file over here. And then, oops, sorry. And then after the colon over here, we specify the actual function's name. So when we go back to the example, we can see that, yeah, so this is sort of making a link and you have to do it uh, yourself manually in this very nice thing we call YAML. The last part, the last missing part is specifying what triggers the execution of this action function. And in our case, since we want to monitor whenever a new block is mined, we need to specify that the trigger is of type block. So this means uh, that every, every single time the block is mined, this function will get called. So there you have it. We just uh, explained how to set up a basic, very basic web three action. And I'm leaving the temp directory and I'm deleting it, hopefully not deleting anything else. Yeah, I'll just remove the force flag to be sure to delete something that I really care about. Uh, all right. So let's see how we can actually, how, how do we actually uh, do all of this, but for a contract that's deployed on chain. So the goal was, and let me just go back to the multi-sig wallet for a moment. The goal is whenever somebody submits a transaction into the wallet, or whenever somebody confirms the transaction or executes the transaction, we want to run an action doing something smart. For example, it sends some message to Discord. It can be transaction, a new transaction arrived, was submitted, was executed, or it can be something even more, uh, more interesting. For now, let's just see how this went. And when I configure this um, tenderly actions thingy, let's first check out the tenderly YAML. I decided to put all my sources into a different folder called Web3 Actions. So this is where I changed the name of the folder. And as you can see, I have a Web3 Actions folder over here. Now, if we go there, we can see that we have the multi-sig TS, and we have some helping libraries over here as well. Um, I'll skip the helper libraries and the advanced steps we did here for now and come back to them in a moment. Um, so let's start by, let's start with the code. And this looks pretty cumbersome. If you decide to use Web3 Actions in your project, you can of course use this as a starter. So if you do want to use it, uh, you would have to, of course, change the username to your own. You would have to, um, you would have to set the project slug to, the, to be the project slug of your own. And just a little break, what is the project slug? So the project slug is, um, you can find it if you go to settings and here, this would be your username and this would be your project slug. So if you have some weird things with caps, capital cases, uh, question marks, and so on, that's not your project slug, this is, so we're going for that. Okay, back to code. So what we did here is that we deployed a, we deployed these two contracts. Let me just take a look at this one. Yeah, so these are deployed. And we wrote one function that will react every single time an event happens on chain. And this event, as I said, can be either transaction submitted, executed, approved. So how do we get that? How do we know which one it is? Uh, the second argument of the action function is called event. And it contains information that's appropriate to your trigger. So in our case, since it's about a transaction, we can cast it into transaction event coming from the tenderly actions package. And then here we can extract some information 
about, uh, we can extract some information about the transaction itself, fields well known. So it's block hash, number, sender, input, logs, uh, network, nonce, and so on and so on. And what we do here, uh, we're getting this in raw form. So nothing is decoded. And if you want to use it in a humanly uh, friendly form that you would have to decode all that stuff. In order to do that, we use Ether's interface. So this class over here allows you to actually um, create an object that can be used to transform these raw form data that come within the transaction event into something more humanly readable, or in other words, it's transforming it into something that's a JSON object that you can use and, uh, and do stuff with it. <clears throat> now, the question may be, where do I get this? What do I give to the interface? Well, we give it the ABI of the contract that you're decoding data, that, that emitted events, for example, uh, that you're trying to decode. Of course, we have to import it somewhere and we can do that like this. So when I go back to code, you can see an ABI directory. So here you would have to put the compiler output from your hardhead project or wherever you compile your smart contract and uh, just place this JSON in here. And it's really important that you don't try to, to do something like import uh, A from uh, dash dash, artifacts, uh, contracts, and so on and so on. So if you do that, your web three action will, uh, you will struggle deploying it because this folder doesn't belong to the web three action project. So this thing over here, it should be self-contained, not referencing anything outside of it. It's a common error. So I'm just uh, laying it out here. So when we create the interface, we can nicely take the event logs and we can transform it into something humanly readable by calling interfaces parse log. And it had this thing over here has enough data so e ethers can parse this for us. So in case of submitting a transaction, we'll take the first and the only pretty much event log. And this is the TX event. We'll skip this part for a second. And we go back here. So here we have to figure out which of these events had happened. So if it is uh, a transaction submission, we want to do one thing. If it's confirmation, we want to do another thing. Executing transaction, we want to do a whole different thing. So let's go over the simplest one and that's the execute transaction. So I'll explain here just how it is to process a transaction coming in and just sending the message to Discord. So here, um, let's take a look at what the transaction event has within the fields. And if you do this, uh, yeah, the, the, the code editor will not really help you. This comes from GitHub's pilot, Copilot. So we would need to know what were the names of the arguments. And to come back here, I'll just, and this one to the right, maybe it's useful. So here's execute transaction. The first argument is owner. The second argument is TX index. So this is the one that, we, that we're looking for. And we're gonna log out transaction executed. And then we're gonna, <clears throat> uh, we're going to, well, skipping this one because it depends on processing it when it first arrived. And the last thing that we want to do is uh, send a message to Discord. Uh, the message to Discord saying the transaction was confirmed by, and then this particular address. So far, so good. So the important things, we received an event from the network. We check, we, we, uh, cast that to a transaction event so we can actually access this in a friendly way using TypeScript. We mapped it into a JSON object, practically the parse logs and took the first entry. And then we, uh, by using this switch, concluded, yeah, we're handling the execute transaction case. 
And in here, we just wanted to log that it's executed and send also a Discord message informing Discord that this had happened. Uh, okay. Another big piece of information here is how do we do that in Discord? So we need a couple of things. The first is, well, just to write down uh, the, that, uh, that write down the message. So this is the body that we want to send. And this is sometimes an object, sometimes it's a string. So we're passing through JSON stringify. Uh, we're also, we also need to have the Discord's webhook URL, similarly like we did with the actions. Now here comes another important part and that's secrets. So secrets are one of the things and web three actions, let me just go back here for a second. Secrets allow you to store some information that you may need in the execution, but it's sensitive. So from here, I can just update it, change it to something different or remove it. The only place I can read it from is here. So even if I wrote, uh, even if I took this and wrote console log, Discord URL, it would, it wouldn't fail, but it would output something like this. So we're uh, really, really <laughs> keeping the secret secret. And the last bit, we're using Axios to post the information to Discord that this thing had happened. All right. Again, so far so good. Um, let me go back over here. So what reactions, nothing is in there. And I'm going to uh, just take a brief look at this. This should be fine. All right. So what we want to do when we finish the writing of the action is to go tenderly actions. I apologize. Actions deploy pretty simple. And when I issue this command, it'll build the Web3 Actions project and it will deploy all the actions to Tenderly. Now, you may remember that we had to do something in a Tenderly YAML file. And while we wait for these actions to actually get deployed, and here they are, it's pending, getting activated, fine. Um, let's take a look at Tenderly YAML. So in this case, we're also, we also have all of these settings that you've seen, and we have our first action multi-sync, and it executes whenever an event takes place. So here we're invoking a function called onActionEvent coming from multisync.ts file, and this is precisely the file that we've just seen. Uh, the second thing that's really important, so yes, we have the code that gets executed. And the second thing is, what are the conditions it gets ex executed under? So we have to specify what triggers it. And this particular function gets triggered by a transaction. And it can, if you stop here, that means any single transaction will run it. But we want to be very specific about this and uh, set it up in such a way that it runs only when an event gets emitted from the contract. So this is why we use filters for, and you can do all sorts of crazy things here um, that are somewhat in the dogs. So we have event emitted. This is the one that we want. And we want to catch it when the contract on this, this address, 0xce, yada, 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 gets, uh, emits actually the event and which event then the one with the name tx submission if you remember we have this very event in our solidity file and the last bit of information which network and that's it so we have to say when a contract on this address deployed to the network three robston emits an event transaction submission then we want to call the function multi on an event. So this is just me reading all the, the same thing uh, our way around. And this also shows an example how you can use the same action for, mul for multiple, um, multiple event types. So this one is event emitted, 
from this contract, but this time it's transaction confirmation. So when somebody says, fine, we like the transaction, this one is event emitted from this contract when uh, the confirmation is revoked, changed by mind. And the last one is when, <clears throat> when somebody actually succeeds executing this transaction. And uh, of course, we have the network. And an interesting thing is that you can also configure your uh, periodic ones. So you can have every single day or here it, cut, it dropped down to five minutes and it's periodic or every on a webhook. So when somebody calls your web three action and wants it specifically to get executed, so you can play around all of these that we saw seen in the dashboard, you can do all of this uh, from the code as well. So this was the last bit. And here we go, we have these deployed. And since we have this periodic one, you can go in here and you can see the execution history. So it executed two minutes ago while I talked. And um, if you go here, it gives you a list. Well, not a list because there were no transactions in it, a list of daily simulations. Um, we also have, we deployed other actions as well. This is, this is the one that we analyzed, the bit that uh, covers um, the, um, the execution of the transaction. And this one over here is invoking from the webhook. So you could wait for, for a transaction to actually execute, but in order to test all of this, you could also go for a manual trigger. What you need to trigger a transaction action <laughs> is actually uh, the transaction cache. So we can go back to, uh, to our transactions screen. This may be useful. We can go back to the transaction screen and let me make this slightly bigger. And I'll take this one, execute transaction, the one that we analyzed, and I'm gonna copy. And I'll just go manual trigger. So here you would just need to specify the network where this uh, transaction happened on. And I know it's Robston because uh, I did this so many times, it's here. And here's the transaction. And if we hit pay, catch, uh, catch payload, it will show you all this data over here. And if I go trigger, I'm not sure if it will succeed with an empty storage. Let's see, all right, it failed. So this means that um, running out of order, uh, running Web3 actions out of order can fail. So we have to actually run it properly. Um, to do this, let me go one by one and I'll take this submit transaction. So I'm taking this one. I'm gonna trigger this one manually and paste this payload first. So we can see that it's an actual thing that somebody tried to put in our web, in our multisig wallet. And um, I'll skip this explanation for now. Hit trigger and hopefully everything goes fine. Oh, no, not really. Yeah, but you get the gist. Uh, there is a slight issue over here that I don't really see. Um, another interesting piece of information that I want to give before wrapping this up is the ability to run these locally. So you can actually uh, you can actually set it all up, and you can go uh, you can actually run all of these as you develop them in a local runtime. So uh, you can use tenderly actions tests. So here you can put the Discord URL, access keys, whatever is required by your Web three actions and just call the test runtime and execute the action. Of course, submitting the um, uh, submitting the data that it requires uh, to get executed. Um, I'll just run this one, and I think we have to wrap it up here. <clears throat> so here we have some data simulations. And I guess that we have an issue with a webhook. All right. 
Uh, but the time is up pretty much. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to answer the questions, I think. So Alex, do you think we have more time here to... Um, um, no, through. unfortunately, we don't have any more time um, now mm -hmm. because we've got a Coinbase workshop starting mm -hmm. um, now. But right. Nenad, thank you so much. Um, for any thank of you that have questions, please post them in the Discord. Nenad is in the Discord, and I'm sure he'd be happy to help you there. Um, sorry that we had to wrap it up so quickly, um, but we really appreciate your time, Nenad. This was an awesome workshop. And to those of you who attended, thank you for coming. I recognize a lot of faces from some of the um, boot camps as well. So it's awesome to see you all again. Um, for those of you that are here, we've got a Coinbase wallet workshop happening now. I've just dropped the Zoom link in the chat. So please feel free to join. And if you do join, I will see you there. And if you don't join, have a good day. Awesome. Thank you.